Hello, everyone, and welcome to the first episode of season two of The Halal Gap. I'm your host, Sophia Alani. And I'm your other host, Skandar Atik. We hope you enjoy this episode. All right. Okay, so we are so pleased to be joined today with one of the most talented people I've had a chance to get to know. Uh, she's an incredibly accomplished writer and director with an impressive resume that includes script development at YouTube Originals, being a writer on the Golden Globe winning show Rami, a writer on the hit Netflix show 13 Reasons Why, and the mastermind behind the Oscars award winning short film Just One Night. She's currently working on her original pilot Uncovered, which is being executive produced by Eva Longoria, and is working on the film adaptation of Aisha at Last with Hollywood powerhouse Amy Pascal. Please welcome... Joining us all the way from isolation in LA, Sahar Jahani. How's that for an intro, huh? How's that for an intro? That was really nice. Can you write that for my bio? I got you. I got you. She, Sahar told me earlier that her entire delivery on the podcast is going to be dependent on how dope her intro is. So I had to, I had to put some work into that one. But uh, how is how is quarantine? How is quarantine life for you? What's going on? How are you keeping busy? Um. So as a writer, I feel like we're already quarantined anyway. Like this is just regular life because that's what I've been doing for the past few months is just sitting in my house in my PJs um, writing. But the, the worst part is like just not being able to like do the, ba- the stuff that I would do to keep myself sane before, like get a coffee, hang out with friends, you know, take a walk. Even in like our parks are closed here. I don't know about you guys, but like yeah, all the trails and like natural habitats and things. What what are they called? Park? Yeah, state parks and stuff. They're all closed. <laughs> so, uh... <laughs> the natural habitat thing. That's when you know wow. you live in LA when you call them natural yeah. habitat things rather than parks. Yeah, like yeah, yeah. Like like the beaches are closed, so it's 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 like it's you know ten times worse. Um, yeah. but, but it's all good because, you know, we need to lower the curve and make sure this thing goes away. So, so you, you know, usually work from home. So I actually, I work from, so I, I have a very weird life. Um, like it just all depends on when things are happening. If I'm in a writer's room, which is like on a TV show, um, I'll be working out of an office, um, in like a, you know, a writer's room, but most of the year like we are in and out of the room um so i have this office that i would rent out with other writers it's like this um, co-working space and i used to work there with other writers but um that's closed now too so now i'm in my uh my home where i grew up with my mom i'm visiting her during quarantine and you know helping her out so i'm literally in my childhood bedroom like as we speak looking at baby pictures of myself so this is where I'm working now Very and that could be highly inspirational for sure yeah tapping so, into so, my roots okay so let's, let's get into that what did first inspire you to become a filmmaker oh uh, man okay I told Sikander this story well I actually haven't told you this story because no no you gave me a leading it. question exactly <laughs> yeah I was saving it for so I, a lot of things, I think a lot of things, you know, led me to think like, oh, I can be a writer. But um, there was a movie, a specific movie, if you guys remember, Bend It Like Beckham. Of yes, course. No. Of course. Of oh course. my God. Oh my God. Um, my sister took me to watch that movie and I was like, what is this like Bend It Like Beckham British thing? Um, I was like maybe, I think 11 or 12. So you saw it in the theaters? Now. I saw it in the theater. Whoa. I was like not expecting anything. I didn't know what it was about. Uh, and we and we go in and, and like no one's in the theater. I think it was like an indie film at the time. It was like one of these like small theaters. And uh, I couldn't, I was like blown away. I was like, oh my God, for the first time I'm seeing a brown girl on screen, like living her truth, playing soccer. It was funny. The story was so well done. Um, and then from... From then on, I, I, I didn't think I could be a filmmaker. I just didn't know how to do that. Like, no one in my community, I don't know about your community, but no one in my community was a filmmaker. I just didn't know people mm. like that. So um, I, I settled to become a journalist. That's what I was going to do. Um, so I ended up in college studying journalism. 
And then it was like 2009, I want to say, when I went to school. Now you guys know how old I am. But um, 2009 to 2013, went to school. That was the time when uh, like video production and digital media was like a thing. So um, everyone was like turning to like YouTube, right? And these journalists, the, the journalists, like outlets and stuff, the newspapers, they didn't know how to function. Like before we had podcasts and stuff, what we're doing right now, um, there was just print and like magazines and like online stuff. So I think people were adapting really quickly to digital media. And someone was like, oh, you should go study film like that. That was my backup plan. Like film was my backup to journalism, which is for my parents, just, um, I think, terrifying. So um, long story short, you know, being in LA growing up here, um, I, I was in proximity to Hollywood, but not there. I was just like, close, but not in it. And then um, slowly learned about internships and stuff. And like, just kind of threw myself into, into storytelling, because that's ultimately what I wanted to do. I just wanted to be a storyteller. And I think film is the medium that I ended up in. But um, yeah, that, does that answer the question? I don't know. That was long, like a long-winded story. But um, No, that, that definitely answers the question. But like, so something you touched on there, you know, talking a little bit about the community and how you didn't grow up necessarily with a lot of filmmakers in, you know, the Irani community or in in the Muslim community, well, the Muslim there, but community yeah. The, yeah, yeah, the Muslim community more more broadly. But you know, like Iran has like a very rich history of film, whereas I think some other you know areas of the Muslim world where we we talk to people in this format, and then you know even within the board, people who are looking to explore creative passions like this as a as a career, um, they t- they sometimes struggle with you know some sort of pressures from the community or even from their family to have more of a traditional career path. Is that something that you also struggled with or was your family pretty supportive all the way through? Yeah. Or? yeah. I think we can all relate to this. Like, I think ev- like anything that's not doctor, lawyer, engineer, I think in any Middle Eastern slash Muslim, South Asian, whatever it is, culture is probably looked down upon. But my one like Achilles heel for my my parents and specifically my dad was that he really liked film and he was a photographer and like a filmmaker himself, but he like, like lied about it. (laughs) And it was basically like hid all like, he'd never tell us like, Oh, I'm buying a camera. He'd just like appear one day with a camera and he had all these like home videos and stuff that I've recovered uh, since then. And I'm like, dad, like you're a filmmaker, like this is what you love to do. Um, And then like, ultimately, I think over time, um, they just like acquiesced. They also they also like knew I was really bad at math and science. Like I was terrible. (laughs) And I think my, my dad tried to like tutor me in calculus. And he just like gave up. He was like, I'm done. (laughs) <laughs> like go in every brown dad you like have like this experience of sitting at your kitchen table crying with your dad just like yelling math at you I don't know if that's happened to everyone else but I, I feel you on that one yeah and both of my parents are teachers so they were like what are we doing wrong like what's you know is it us or is it you and my dad even brought like a whiteboard from his school he like in, installed it on my wall like in my bedroom he's like all right every night we're gonna sit down and do AP calculus and <laughs> we're gonna figure this oh out <laughs> um I ended up getting a C but I think that was like okay because um I was failing before so so improvements small improvements and <laughs> C's get degrees I heard C's they get degrees and hey like I ended up at UC Irvine which is like uh, no I don't know big deal degrees. No big deal. It's it's actually not a big deal. It's really not. <laughs> uh, it's just like the number ten public school in the nation. Um, just no big deal. <laughs> <laughs> no. But uh, I think I ended up in a really good place. Like I, I, um, Irvine is very close to LA. Like I, I, I wanted to go to Berkeley, which is where my sisters both had gone. So I was kind of like a black sheep of the family. And then I studied film and they were like, oh, my God, she's really going to, you know, like not have a career. So I think at all times I just had this immense pressure to do well just because that's the nature of our culture. And so that fear and guilt and shame just like 
propelled me to do like my best in everything that I was doing and um, somehow ended up here. I think my my parents really didn't get it until not I they didn't get it when I did, did Rami when I wrote the show because they were like Rami who and then I think they really got it that when my my mom just understood it like when I when I was on 13 reasons why because she she knows what Netflix is right so she can open up Netflix and, and she, she won't watch the show but she knows it's there so so just I so I understand correctly your mom never got Hulu she was like Netflix. I get it. I get Netflix, <laughs> but I'm not buying yeah. this Hulu thing to watch your Rami show. Absolutely not. Absolutely not. Um, yeah, also, she special. like had heard from her friends that uh, like Rami's not a good show. Like it's kind of haram. <laughs> oh, and, and so she just she's um she re- she's like you know I'm gonna ignore the fact that you wrote a sex scene. Uh, I'm just gonna pretend that didn't happen, and then you know we'll be we'll be all good. So. <laughs> <laughs> that's that's her the logic is she just like ignores everything and so um but it works out it works out i think they're finally like proud of me now after like 10 years so <laughs> all worth it you know? on that like how was writing that episode because that is like one of the more controversial as you mentioned episodes um mm-hmm. so far anyway in that series so how how was it writing that also one of the best names of an episode probably might i add do the ramadan 100 percent agreed <laughs> i cannot take credit for that i think hulu marketing came up with that but thank oh. you guys um <laughs> no i mean i think at my whole experience on that show i've talked a lot about it rami's talked about it he was on your podcast i think a while back yeah, if you so. listen if you listen to the podcast you would know these things but <laughs> i did not i did not i I, ref, I refuse to listen to rami's no i'm kidding um <laughs> first of all rami and i have a have a have a good friendship and uh we're all friends and everything's cool and we're actually working on stuff together now so um i think i can talk honestly about it because we we self-critique and i think the best part about working with him is that he like totally understands the criticisms and he's he's not ignoring it and I think in season two um hopefully like a lot of the stuff you know uh, while we were writing a lot of things popped up and I think it's important to talk about this in Muslim spaces because and and other spaces in general because people don't understand how a how like a show gets created so I think that's part one of this conversation we can talk a little bit about the writer's room and like how decisions are made and then like everything that happens in production and post and beyond. Right. So it's all every episode and every story at every iteration is changing constantly. Um, And every time like they edit or do a draft or whatever, the story evolves. So if we can start with like the writer's room experience, um, we were all walk us through like, Yeah. You, walk us through from like even maybe before that, right? Like from right. the idea component and then and then bring us back into your Rami writer's room experience. Like how does it go from I've got an idea to right. like even getting into the writer's room? Right. Well, I, I wasn't part of, um, you know, the pitching process because that's... That but you've been part of other... You've been other... Sure. I can talk about like that. overall. So overall, I mean, I think we'll, what happens is, you know, you, you have an idea, you're either a writer or you're a talent like Rami, who was a comedian and he's been doing this for so long. And the way it works is like you, you write a treatment or you write a pilot. I think he had both when he was pitching this show. Um, A pilot is obviously the first uh, episode of the series and a treatment and a Bible is basically like your overview of the show. So it's sort of like a, a longer document that, um, describes what the show is, the characters, the journey, the arcs, etc. So you do all that work prior to pitching it to a a studio or a network. And the first thing you want to do is attach producers, a studio, a production company. Um, For him, it was A24 and his producers, Gerard Carmichael, who is a famous comedian and had his own show, The Carmichael Show, on NBC, and um, a few other folks, right? So you gather a group of people. It's called packaging, essentially. Um, what what the goal is, you try to attach, you know, the best names, the best producers, 
um, and you and you package a series so that you can take it to a network who is looking to make a show that already feels pretty complete. Like most of the, most of the time, when you take a show to a network, it's it's already like the whole story is basically there. At least the pilot is there, um, and you have a bible. Like you you thought out everything that possibly could come up in that pitch. So a lot of these shows are already formulated at the like conception level, um, even before you get into a writer's room. So I'm sure, you know, Rami pitched to a bunch of places, um, you know, and I'm sure he got a bunch of offers and they ended up going with, with Hulu um, because that was probably the best offer, right? So a lot of the times you could pitch to a network and all they'll want to do is like develop the concept with you. But for, for Rami, he got a pilot order, which is a really big deal. Like that doesn't happen a lot. Um, and it's very difficult to get a pilot. So what they did is they shot the pilot. Um, they got, you know, a crew attached, actors, a director, Harry Bradbeer, who had done Fleabag, which is like amazing. Um, they shot the pilot. And at that point, they don't have a writer's room, right? So, so the pilot is... Rami and his executive producers writing. Um, so I had nothing to do with the pilot and everyone who like comes at us with the, <laughs> the female character, <laughs> in the pilot, we had nothing to do with that. Um, and, you know, he, so, so the pilot gets green lit at Hulu and that means he now gets a series order. Sometimes you get a full series order without a pilot. That's very rare. Um, most of the time you have to prove that the pilot concept works um so it's a whole process and this is like a year before we even started the writer's room so again long story short um they get the pilot greenlit and then rami and a24 the producers everyone they start looking for writers to be part of the writer's room and at the time i was at youtube originals i was a assistant slash coordinator which basically means like I did all the bitch work, let's be honest. Um, but it was the best time, I think, to learn about, you know, the business of show business. Um, we at YouTube Originals, it was kind of like the Netflix of YouTube. We were sourcing material to make shows and I was reading a lot of scripts. And I was also going to school at night, um, getting my MFA in screenwriting. So I knew I wanted to be a writer. Um, I was just you know, trying to do the work and, and also like stay alive and all those things. Um, so I had written a pilot, Uncovered, which you mentioned, Sikandar, at the beginning. And this was my sample for getting into the room. So usually what happens is like the agents and the managers in Hollywood, they all hear that a room is hiring, right? So everyone starts submitting their people, like their writers for the room. And I'm sure Rami got like literally hundreds of samples. I'm, I'm, I'm absolutely certain of that because um, every showrunner gets bombarded with samples. And thankfully, like being the one of 10 Muslims in Hollywood, we I think we had like a connection through someone else. So somebody like submitted my sample to him. And then I had an agent, a friend of mine who like became my agent and he submitted my sample. So like you, you basically bombard the company with names and he, 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 he obviously wanted Muslim writers. So um, I somehow got an interview with him and the showrunner. Um, our showrunner was a woman named Bridget Bedard who had done Transparent for three seasons. So very like amazing woman, by the way, she's awesome. Um, so I, so I, I go to the interview and uh, I, I get into the room, but I wasn't a writer, actually. I was a writer's assistant, which is a whole other thing. Um, but I ended up getting an episode and then I also was the script coordinator, which is a whole other thing that I won't get into. Um, and I went to New York and I shot, you know, the show with them. So it was a whole experience, but... Um, did that, so so that, did that like evolve over the course of the, like the, over the course of time you were there? Where, did you start off as like a, like a writer's assistant and then you got more and more work piled on as they were like, oh, this girl's pretty awesome. And then. Yeah. I mean, more, it looked like, yeah, I think like, because I didn't have any credits before they couldn't hire me as a staff writer and that's totally normal. Like people work as writer's assistants for many, many years before they become writers. 
Um, but I was in the room and there was only five other people in the room. So it was a very small room. Usually for a half hour, you might have seven or eight or nine or 10 people. Um, but we had five to six people. Like it was very, very bare bones. And um, they encouraged me. They were like, look, we can't hire you as a writer, but you're, you're a writer's assistant. And basically that means like you're taking notes the whole time. You're, you're using cards to like, you know, put up um, episode uh, beats and stuff. So it's, it's a lot of the work, but, but they're like, we want you to talk and speak and pitch ideas and basically function as a writer. So they were very nice to me. Like I was usually a writer's assistant doesn't talk. Like you're just supposed to take notes and listen and, you know, make sure you're capturing everything. But as one of the only Muslims in the room, like I had to talk and I had to speak and I ended up pitching a lot of stuff and um, ended up getting an episode. And I mean, yeah, it was, it was a really, it was like the best sort of scenario for a writer's assistant because sometimes in other rooms, you don't even get an episode. And again, like I said, you, you might be an assistant for four or five seasons before you even become a writer. So I, I, I fast tracked a little bit, um, thankfully because of Rami. And, and because like I did the work, let's, let's be real. Uh, <laughs> I think I just like, did, I did a good job. I think, I hope he would say the same thing. Um, and yeah, I mean, so, so talking about the, the dynamic of the room, uh, again, you, you have to understand that Rami's doing this for the first time, right? Like he's never run a show before. Um, he's never even like written anything else besides this pilot, like to be very frank. And, and he would say the same thing which is kind of insane to think about, to think about his journey from a comedian to like now running his own show and trying to figure out all these different elements all at the same time. Uh, but at the same time, we only had two other Muslims besides him in the room, me, myself, and this woman named Minhal Beg. And the rest of the people were all white or half white and not Muslim. So there is this whole dynamic of first of all, trying to, um, you know, tell them like what our culture and our religion is about, like trying to make them understand, and then having them pitch on stories that relate to that culture and that faith, right? Like it's, I, I, I actually felt bad for a lot of the white people in the room, because it's like, what are they going to pitch? Like, I did the Ramadan episode. How do they know like what Ramadan even is? Like if they don't experience it, like how are they supposed to pitch on stories about an emotional experience that they've never had? So as much as we tried to educate them and we took them to a masjid, we like did Friday prayer. Like we did everything we could to be yeah. like this world. Um, it's very hard. So I, I actually felt. <laughs> I actually remember Rami. <laughs> Rami introduced me to some like random white dude at the IC during Jumbo once and he was yeah. like hey this is bob yeah. he's working on my show and i'm like hi bob nice to meet you <laughs> it's just like it's probably <laughs> ryan but okay yeah it could be ryan it could be ryan um, <laughs> poor ryan poor ryan. no Brian's i'm trying to keep i'm trying to keep um, ryan's identity private okay <laughs> but, oh, oh, oh right right sorry sorry yeah bob bob too but <laughs> but so like you have to understand like that was uh <laughs> Yeah, so that was that was the dynamic. I mean, it was tough to, and, and then on top of that, I think Rami has a very specific tone and he has a very specific style of comedy. So we have to match like his style, right? If you've seen his stand up, um, it's 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 very nuanced and it's also like poking fun of Muslims and non Muslims and it's it's making fun of everyone and it's doing it in a very intellectual way that doesn't pander to white people. Like, I don't think his comedy is not like, oh, let me make fun of my, you know, parents who have accents. Like, he refuses to do that, which I actually appreciate. And it's more about let's be introspective about 9-11 or like politics and, and our own cultural nuances that make our community who we are. Um, and also like everything else in pop culture. So um, we we had to like balance that and and. And like your job as a writer on a show, whether it's with your friend who is a Muslim guy or like a person who's done this for 20 years, like your job is there is, is there to serve their story. And that's what you're supposed to do is you're supposed to pitch to them um, because ultimately like you want to make their life easier and you're there to tell their story. 
And so from the very beginning, we knew this show was very specific. It was about Rami, the character and the person, not about the entire Muslim population. So I think a lot of the criticism uh, that comes from a show like that is that it's too specific. Like it's too... Uh, too much of his life and his story. And I think a lot of us crave, um, I guess, more representation from other characters. And it was really hard to do that with such a limited real estate in a show. But that's, that's not to say that like mistakes didn't happen. And, and of course, like, you know, representation I felt with the female characters was very skewed. Um, And that all comes from a, a perspective that's very male driven, like your showrunner is a 28 year old man. So like, that's who you're talking about. And that's who you're pitching to. And so a lot of the times we would have essentially like arguments in the room about a scene. Um, In particular, I can talk about my episode because I wrote that but the the character Selma, who is the older woman who he sleeps with. um, And they have somewhat of an affair afterwards. I, I'm, I guess I'm spoiling it for people who haven't watched it's okay. it. okay. We've, we've spoiled spoiler. it already. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Spoiler alert. Yeah. If you haven't seen the season that came out a year ago, please go back and watch it. <laughs> and also, um, what are you doing right now? Right. Are you even... <laughs> <laughs> are you even quarantined, bro? Exactly. You have no excuses. But um, with that character, I, ha- I personally had a lot of conflict. I was like, a, uh, I, for a lot of the show, I, I just had to kind of remove myself from judging my own characters and judging the women in the show because my initial instinct was always to like protect them and to be like, no, she's like an, an empowered woman who would never do this and she'd never sleep with a guy half her age who's like a loser. Like, like that was my initial instinct is... Um, the fact that it seemed like everyone in the show wanted to sleep with the character and that his arc and his journey was all based off of this conflict, which is his inability to really be celibate. I mean, that is really the, the, the identity of the show. And that was kind of hard, not just from a, like a Muslim woman perspective, but from a storyteller perspective, because I had been trained in my MFA writing and all that to like have conflict, right? And conflict is emotional and it's plot driven and it's all these things. And it felt like in the show, at least in season one, a lot of the conflict was just this internal struggle between identity. And sometimes it's not enough, right? It's not enough to just have that one conflict. So I think the show that Rami really wanted to create is very different from traditional TV that we've seen. And that was a hard process for all of us. Like we all had to kind of reevaluate how we had seen television before and really cater the story and the narrative to this showrunner who wanted to tell um, a very different kind of story, if that makes sense. So we had a lot, we just, every choice, every character we discussed like for many, many hours and I, we, we talked about all the different angles, like, is Sanma going to be perceived as, um, you know, a, a promiscuous woman? Like, what's, you know, you know, what are we trying to say with this character? And I think ultimately, we landed on this idea that it's okay for this character to make these choices. And we, we can't put our own judgments on the character. Now, whether that was um, earned in the story or not is a whole other question. I think I think it happened so quickly and it was so provocative that people were just like, oh my God, what is she doing? I think had we told the story um, in a different way, we could have possibly earned that moment a little bit easier, in my opinion. And that's just like from a writing perspective. Like it's not even from a Muslim perspective. It's just like, we don't really see her in the episode more than twice. So for her to then sleep with the main character, it, it was kind of jarring for even me as a writer. And I pitched like multiple versions. I was like, what if she um, asks for something else? Like, what if she just wants intimacy, right? And she just wants to like be cuddled or held. Can they just like hold each other? Like we had to, uh, I had to like pitch all the versions of it. And then I think bottom line, 
what you're trying to do is you're trying to get your character from point A to point B and C and D and E. And for for Rami's character to, to go to Egypt, this is what we discussed ultimately, is that he has to do something really, really bad, which in our faith, like sleeping with a Muslim woman is. Well, I mean, let's clarify, I'm a married, a married Muslim woman <laughs> for the context of the show. For those who haven't, who's those who haven't seen it, it it's not just like, you know, got to defend a little bit the decision. So, okay, carry yeah, on. That's, right. that's what I meant. A married Muslim woman. If you sleep with any Muslim woman, it is. Yeah, I'm like, damn. Um, oh, okay. wow. no. uh, yes. My bad. So, so yeah. So, so that's a really bad thing to do. Even if it's her choice, even if it's his choice, like they're still committing Zina, right? Is that the word, right word? Yes. yes. I think, yeah. Right? We avoid Islamic discussions. I think. Uh, <laughs> oh, no, sorry. I think. Sorry. Okay. No, 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 no. I'm joking. I'm joking. I think uh, Zina is like just premarital. I don't know what it's called okay, okay. when it's like cheating. Adultery, like like right? So, well, I know it's adultery, adul- but like the Islamic you know, but term. Like in general, adultery, adultery is. I'm Googling this as we talk. <laughs> okay, carry on. Where is our Shia? <laughs> okay carry on keep going why keep don't going. you guys have a sheikh on hand um no so We've adultery about in general yeah. is uh is really bad so 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 he had to make a terrible choice so zina all. can include adultery as well just fyi to okay, everybody great, great, but, great. yeah so I was you right. were right don't let anybody see that so, so, <laughs> it's like what is he doing um no but we had to we had to we had to have the character make choices that ultimately led him to run away to go to Egypt to like escape everything and he has that conversation with his his father in the show that's like really emotional and impactful so you you have to consider all the other parts that come after my episode and and really the fifth episode is the is the pinnacle and the the climax of the season because you're you're in the middle of it all so it has to be earth shattering and I think anything other than sex in that moment would not have been earth shattering. Um, I mean, we can argue about this forever, but that's the choice that we made ultimately. So I just want people to know that there, there was a lot of discussion behind these choices. Um, you know, whether that comes across on screen or not, and whether people identify with the characters or not, um, that's really not the goal. Like, the goal is to tell a good story and to tell the story that we wanted to tell. It's not about appeasing like every person out there um so so those those were the hard choices we had to make and there's so many stories like that with every episode that we can you know talk about but um yeah i think i'll just i'll let you i'll let you ask more questions but (laughs) no 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 that that's actually very insightful honestly because you you see the finished product but you don't see the thought and like the hours and hours of discussion that goes into how did that decision get made and how did that decision get made not just for that episode but for the episodes to follow for the trajectory of that character not just for this season but for seasons to come you know so on and so forth so i mean getting to look behind a little bit of like behind the scenes really not even like from a film production standpoint but from just pen to paper standpoint just talking about the character uh i think it it's really really insightful so Thank you for sharing that journey. That was that was cool. A hundred percent. That was super cool. And I think as Sikandar mentioned, like I don't think a lot of people realize it. But also one question I wanted to ask on your journey, like at the end of it, when you got to go to New York and you got to like see it come to life, like what you had written, like what was that like? And working with like an actress like Purna Jagannathan was like in everything. That that's pretty cool too. Yeah, it was really cool. I mean, a lot of the writers didn't get to come because we wrote all the episodes first in the writer's room and then, and then you know, the room basically ended and, and only a few of us got to go to New York. So I felt very lucky to be there and to see it all happen. And, and it was a really like hands-on team effort from like every person on the production because we had very little budget. We were shooting in New York, which is like the worst city to shoot anything honestly like I already have my gripes about New York but uh to be shooting in like you know the fall where it's raining and it's cold and um I wasn't even on set like a lot of the time I was in the office like doing the work but 
uh, I know that it was really grueling for everyone. So it, it took a lot, but to be there was important. Like I wasn't just the script coordinator and, and we, you know, we, I talk about this a lot. I had to kind of step up and be like a Muslim consultant because we truly had very few Muslims on the show in any of the departments. And I tried to, you know, we tried to hire Muslim PAs at least who could be, um, you know, on set as assistants. And we had a really awesome PA season one, um, Adil Kamal, who's now a writer on the show. Um, we had a few other Middle Eastern folks who could just really like step in to like say something if, if it felt off. Um, but I have to say the great thing about A24 and all the production heads in the show is that they really, really did their research in terms of how how does Rami's family's house look, right? And feel and who are the actors playing the roles? Like, I think we casted very well, um, or they did, I should say. And and at least visually, like the house looks like, his, it looks like exactly like his house that he grew up in because there's pictures that you can compare. Um, just every everything was very researched. Like they all tried their very best to make it look and feel um, authentic because that's really what A24 is all about. Now, like there were moments that um, I stepped in mainly with like wardrobe with the, the women who wore headscarves. And um, I really, this is my biggest. You're the official hijab thing. consultant. <laughs> this is, I was the official hijab consultant season one. I will say that proudly. Um, and, and the wardrobe team was really kind to me. Like they were like, we're, like, can you please like look at these pictures and let us know what you think. Like they really, really wanted to get it right. And um, with Porna, actually, she was she was so trying to embody like a hijabi woman that she was like, I want you to put it on me. Like I want you to tie it how you tie it. So there's a picture of us standing next to each other. We look exactly the same because she's wearing her hijab. It's the same color as mine on the day that she was on set, and I was there. It, it was it it was really cute actually um I will savor that picture forever but uh <laughs> all the hijabis look like me which which is also a problem because the you know hijabis all wear their scarves differently so we we tried to cast the background actors as real Muslims like real people in New York so a lot of them came like ready to go with their like their hijabs they're like you know I don't know I'm not going to say cultural names but like you know, South Asian women have their own thing. Like everyone has their own thing. So everyone kind of came prepared and in these big, like, you know, the mosque scenes or like Ramadan scenes. So that was good. But um, there was a moment on in my episode where they're at the mosque, they're praying. And a lot of the background actors were not Muslim. They just look brown. So we, we had to stop production at one point because I was like, guys, this looks really, really off. Like I was looking at the monitors. I was talking to our showrunner. And Rami was, Rami was also in every scene of this show, like almost every episode, every scene. So he couldn't always catch this stuff. So he was like, I need you to like really stay on top of it and look at the monitors and tell me if something looks off. So that was kind of my job is to like, flag these things and uh, at one point someone was praying incorrectly like they were going to Ruku and it was like so and I was like oh my god we need to stop and like just show everyone how to pray or at least pretend to pray because this is this looks very wrong so that's what we did we stopped production in the middle of a I'm scene I'm so glad you did that Rami for all like, of all right, Hollywood yeah. <laughs> I mean, it would have been embarrassing. It would have been like, guys. It, it happens so you. frequently. I'll never forget in like the 90s, especially when there would be like those typical movies with like those action movies of like Muslim bad guys. And none of them knew how to pray correctly. It's like hire one Muslim guy to just teach all of you guys, please. So I'm, I'm, I'm glad yeah. you did that I mean, for there, all of There are Muslim Islam. consultants, <laughs> but thank you. thank you. Thank you so much. There are, there are consultants. Um, but unfortunately, I, I even saw it in, in a recent episode of Superstore, and I will gladly call them out because the guy was like just mumbling like like Arabic, like I don't even know what <laughs> yeah. to say. Yeah. And it was all wrong. I was like, oh my God, this is this is bad. So no, we were very that's the only that's that. the only good thing I liked about Homeland is uh is, is Damien Lewis prayed properly. <laughs> <laughs> I guess that's kind of a spoiler too, but you know. Okay, so let's let's move on from Rami because I think you know you obviously are a very talented creator of your own right, 
and you're starting to get more opportunities to write your own projects and, and, and get your stories out there. So I want to get a sense from you from like more of a, uh, just like perspective, because like you said, you know, you are at the end of the day, a storyteller, and I'm assuming that there's specific stories that you're, you're hoping to tell now that you've got an opportunity to uh, put your own original content out there a little bit more. Um, so can you kind of, you know, obviously being a Muslim in Hollywood is one thing, being a, a, a woman in Hollywood is one thing. Are, are there specific types of stories that you're looking to, to, to hopefully share with the world now that, you know, you've got more of an opportunity to do so? Yeah, I, absolutely. I mean, to me, you know, telling women's stories and Muslim women's stories is, is important, not just because like we're living in this moment where diversity is like a key word and everyone wants to tell these stories, but because that's been my living truth since I was born. Like, that's all I know is being a Muslim woman. I, I'm not like a convert. I'm not like, I didn't live like another life. Like, that's just my reality. Right. And until I feel like I see and, and, and I, won't, I won't even say accurate description because I don't think there there exists such a thing. I will say someone who feels a character who feels true to my universe and to my life. Like I won't stop telling those stories until I feel like, all right, I, I've told I've told my piece. I, I had it on TV or film or whatever it is. And I'm good. Like, I just don't think that exists yet. And I don't think um, it'll ever exist for every single person. Like, I think we should just keep telling more stories because it it's going to be different every single time. Um, so for me, Muslim women are of utmost importance uh, right now, just because like, that, that's my reality. Um, so my short film was about two Muslim girls who go to a bar for the first time and like secrets are revealed. It's very dramatic. And, and that's the kind of stuff like I want to talk about. I want to talk about the nuance of, you know, being just like the day to day Muslim and, and not having it be about identity all the time. I think that's kind of our go to because, uh, you know, we want to express ourselves as artists. And that's our emotional truth right now is just like, identity and who we are. But I think like, even now, and, and, and five years from now, and 10 years from now, being a Muslim character is not going to be special. I hope, like, I hope it's not going to continue to be something special, you know? I Okay, so I, I genuinely want to know your thoughts on that, because I feel like we've had this, like, I even I even talked to, to Rami about it a little bit, and I got his thoughts, but I want to know your thoughts, because I think you come from a very different lens. Um, like, obviously, we're going through this, this somewhat minor shift in terms of normalizing, you know, Muslims in Hollywood, uh, you know, tends to be male Muslims currently. Um, you know, with like Hassan and Rami and like Aziz and um, all these guys. Do you think it's easier now than, you know, maybe five years ago when you were first in school trying to get into this stuff? And do you think there's more of a, a lane, I think, for most, do you think for Muslims or is it still something that you've got to kind of beat down and, and like make your own path a little bit? Yeah, I mean, I can only speak from my experience. I know everyone's saying it's easier now and everyone's looking for the, the Muslim story and it's so easy to like pitch, but it's truly like not, <laughs> I will say that. And it, it's spe especially for Muslim women, I think um, I'm, I'm, you know, I'm doing a pilot with Eva Longoria. You talked about it a little bit earlier and it's literally we'll, been we'll in dive development. Into that. Don't worry. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's been in development for a year and a half. And oh, wow. I, I don't, you know, I, I'll be honest about like the struggles because, you know, when I first wrote it, everyone was like, oh my God, this is amazing. Like, you know, we need to see this on screen, blah, blah, blah. But it, when it comes to actually getting down to the nitty gritty of like, let's make this, uh, I think a lot of people are hesitant because they haven't, they still haven't seen an ensemble hijabi cast. And that's what the show is. It's, it's all Muslim women. Like it's all hijabis. I don't even, I don't even think I have a non, -hij I have like one non hijabi, but it's about a Muslim woman who works at a hijab company. So like, that's the story. And I think it's, you definitely have one. You definitely have one non hijabi. I have one non hijabi. Yes, I do. I, I have one. Um, or, or actually you're right. No, I have two. I have, two. or no, I have one. I have one. The roommate. 
Sorry, Sikander's read it. Oh my god, this I've read so the great. pilot and it's actually great. Yeah. It's a, it's so okay, let's dive into it a little bit. Do you, is it cool? Yeah. Can we can we talk a little yeah, bit about uncovered? About it. Okay, so what sure. happened? Why did it take? Why why has it been in limbo for a year and a half? What do you think? And and maybe so, if you can just kind of start off by talking about what it what the concept is. Yeah, so uncovered is about a young Muslim woman, Yara who has done everything right her entire life, you know, according to the rules of our faith. And y'all know we have a lot of rules. Um, So, you know, typical good Muslim girl, whatever that means to you. But for her, it means like following everything to the T. So no sex before marriage, no touching before marriage, actually. Uh, No drinking, no drugs. And literally like just embodying what it means to be um, a good Muslim in her brain. And in the pilot, you know, she's confronted with this reality check of sorts, which is like, you know, everyone is is kind of doing stuff. <laughs> like as Muslims, we all sin and we all, you know, falter and we do things that we're not proud of. And she kind of has to- Except for Hamada, some- who's just quietly in the background <laughs> being a good Muslim. I know. <laughs> we'll, let that, we'll let that go. <laughs> Yeah, I know this guy has not spoken and I'm secretly like uh, getting anxiety. Are you there, <laughs> Hamada? Can he, can he talk to us? I, I am. I'm here. <laughs> Hi. Um, so, yeah, so she's confronted with this reality of like, you know, people are doing things in her life all around her. Her roommates having sex with, you know, a, guy, a white guy, her perfect goody two shoes boyfriend slash, you know, fian- almost fiance. Um, is not who she thought he was. And she also happens to work at this hijabi, like modest fashion company, where they tout themselves uh, in living this modest lifestyle. And her world is kind of turned upside down. And she's forced to confront some of these questions um, that she's been living with her entire life. So that's kind of the show. It's it's kind of like a Rami in reverse. Um, so it's, it's not someone who's like, oh, I, you know, I, I, I want to have sex with people. It's 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 a girl who's like confronting the reality of not having experienced um, life because she made that choice and she's proud of that choice, right? So, Sorry, can, yeah. I say, can I ask like the the theme of modesty? Like you mentioned, your Oscars finalist film just one night a little while ago, um, and like with with that and with this, it seems like modesty is kind of a theme that kind of seems to come up or like the idea of like having this perfect persona or this perfect image that is kind of not really who we are. Um, Is that like something that like you mean to keep coming back to? Does that have any significance to you? Oh my God, totally. I mean, I wear hijab and I think I, I, I've been wearing it since I was 12. So modesty um, is something that I, I, I associate hijab with and it's definitely a part of it, but it's also so much more, right? Um, I feel like hijab has become my identity in so many ways, but in a lot of ways, I think we also use it today as this sort of um, commercialized commodity. Um, and I was I was inspired by a lot of these Instagrammers and social media influencers who I, I think it's great. I think it's really, really great that we have visible hijabis selling a product, wearing, you know, the highest level of fashion and walking on runways. But at, at some point, we're also confronted with this reality of, is that modest, right? Is, is, it, a, is it okay for a covered woman to, to, to wear a certain piece on a runway? Like, is that the point of hijab, right? So it's, that's, not, that's not the entire theme of the show, but it's definitely part of it. And yeah, it's, it's, a, it's a concept I come back to all the time because I was told as a hijabi, like you have to be extra good, right? You have to be extra nice to everyone. You have to be um, the best version of a human because everyone's looking at you as this like symbol of your religion. And I just think that's really unfair. Mm -hmm. Like I I live my life uh, for a long time, just just trying not to um, bother anyone. I was walking on eggshells all the time and trying to be the best version of myself because I was like, man, if, if I mess up, somebody's going to be like, that Muslim girl just messed up, you know, because I associate people with thinking of me as as the only thing that they see, which is a Muslim woman. But there's so much more to me than that. So I think 
I will always keep coming back to these themes as long as I feel like I'm facing them myself, Mm -hmm. which is very true for me. Like I, I've had to grapple with this identity a lot. So it's something I I like to talk about. And I, I just don't think there's enough conversation about it. Um, But it's very controversial, right? Like the short film was very controversial, even at the Oscars. I mean, I, I make the gasp that went through the audience hearing that reaction, which I am sure you anticipated, but like, what was that like? Oh my God. I was so scared. Honestly, I, I like had to walk out because I didn't want to see people's reactions. Cause I, that was the first time I had shown the film in front of a major Muslim audience. Um, I expect the reactions in like a non-Muslim audience, but I had, I had no inkling of like what would happen with so many people in that room. You guys had 12 at that event so it was sure did (laughs) scary but the great thing was that a a lot of women afterwards and men and everyone just came up to me and they were like oh my god we loved your film um and it was so supportive like I I've never experienced that before so it was it was I think just a confirmation that people want to talk about these issues and I'm sure there was a probably a better way to tell that story. Uh, but, you know, I, I have my limitations as a storyteller and I've continued to keep on getting better and better. But um, at the time, like, that's just the story that I thought was important to tell. Yeah. So were you, like, genuinely surprised by a lot of the support that the film had received? I am. I am genuinely surprised because um, I ha- I d- actually had gone to – I went to Michigan and I showed it at – um. Deer, in Dearborn so and I, I got a very different reaction um I think Ooh, tell us that more. was <laughs> yeah um in front of a Muslim audience yeah in front of a Muslim audience and it was like a, a more you know for lack of a better word a liberal audience I mean it was at the Arab American Museum it wasn't like in a mosque or something so it was like a mixture of religious non-religious like hijabis non-hijabis like everyone was there but the reaction was really strong. A lot of people, um, a lot of people loved it. I had a really like emotional reaction from one audience member who was like, this is my story. Thank you for telling it. And then I had a lot of young women be like, I, we think that you're sending the wrong message to young women. And I just, I was a little, I was a little taken aback by that because I was like, what's the message that you're receiving from this film? Because there's two stories here. There's there's a story of the of the girl who wants to live her truth and she doesn't want to wear a hijab anymore, but she's kind of doing it in the wrong way, you know, and she's dragging her friend along with her. And then the story of, of, of the young woman who has to accept the fact that her friend is living this truth and also makes an error in judgment. So there's, there's no statement here. It's, it's not saying hijab is good or bad. Like that's what some people took away from it. And I was really confused about why um, that was the takeaway and not like the ultimate story of like acceptance and friendship and like judgment that we all place on each other. So I think in a way, um, I think different communities are just struggling with different things. Like in my community in Los Angeles, so many young women, my friends, in fact, are all grappling with this issue of hijab. Like a lot of them don't want to wear it and they end up taking it off, but they end up leaving the community because they're afraid of judgment and shame. And I think that's so detrimental. I think it's so sad that someone can't be their full selves in our Muslim communities. And, and like, that was kind of case in point in, in Dearborn. Unfortunately, um, I love I love Dearborn for anyone who's listening from Dearborn, but but there was a sense of if anybody's like, listening from Dearborn, thank you, thank you for tuning in to our <laughs> podcast. But anyway, carry on. Yeah, but if, but honestly, like I just feel like, and and kudos to them. I think they just have a really strong sense of identity and sense of self. And a lot of people were like, "This is just giving the wrong message, and we don't want to send the wrong message to our young women." Which I which I completely understand and I respect but I think it just speaks volumes to like what happened at in Edmonton versus other places and and by the way like this now after Edmonton I've shown it to a few other Muslim communities and everyone has a supportive reaction so um in the moment in Dearborn I was like oh my god did I did I make a terrible film right did I Hmm. poke at something that I shouldn't have poked at but I, I, I don't believe that. I think deep down there's a reason um, that I wanted to tell this film and it's because so many of my friends are struggling. And 
I'm struggling. Like I'm a hijabi who sometimes doesn't want to wear hijab. Like I will admit that. And I think anyone who who's who's a hundred percent all the time in it, like wow, like mashallah, like kudos to you. But I think I think if you don't question yourself sometimes, then um, I'm not quite sure, you know, where where that comes from. But I think everyone's in doubt a lot, and I think it's okay to be in doubt. Um, I just, I just, uh, you know, want to say that because I don't think anyone is always a hundred percent certain of anything. So, um, and that's, that's just art, like examining yeah. your, your truth in yourself. So. Yeah. Uh, yeah. That's uh, no, sorry. I didn't mean to over sorry, Sophia, go ahead. It's cool. Sikander. Just go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> no, all I was going to say, all I was going to say, all, all I was going to say is that, um, you know, we, so we, we've like struggled with that with the Moscars, right? I mean, this is now my fifth year on the board and we've had instances where we've had to do a lot of like internal discussion about films about, you know, is this doing a disservice to the an intention of what we're trying to accomplish with the Oscars, right? In terms of, you know, building bridges and showcasing, you know, more of the uh, complexities of the Muslim community, but in a way that doesn't put the Muslim community down in any way. And so we had an internal conversation about just one night before we decided to show it. And overwhelmingly, like I'm talking like 25 to one, uh, people were like, we have to show this movie person. because we, we don't talk about that. Um, but, but, but uh, no, but, you know, overwhelmingly, I think everybody kind of realized that this isn't a story about like saying hijab is, you know, right or wrong. That's not the point of the story. It's about people's journey. It's about acceptance, it's about judgment. It's about, you know, making sure that people are, you know, that showcasing that people are on their own journeys and that it's, it's okay to, to, to be supportive of that. So we were all over it. We thought it was a movie that had to be shown. Obviously we had to make some, some edits for some bad language, but, uh, but other than that, I mean, you know, I, I hope you found that we were true to, to what the story was in, in, in showcasing it the way we did. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I totally understand. And I appreciate, you know, the warnings because, you know, these guys have young kids in that audience. No, no, I really do because I realize like this is a family affair, and a lot of the times like filmmakers are like, "I'm going to like an adult festival where there's no," but like this was like a very wholesome family event, and um, I, I, I think ultimately I was I was very happy with the choice to like censor some parts, and I get it, like I appreciate that, and you guys went above and beyond to accommodate the story and ultimately like try to share it. Um, you know, in the best way with the community. So I'm, I'm amazing. Amazing. Awesome. Um, cool. Go ahead, Sophia. I want to ask a question. <laughs> um, no, no, I just said go ahead. <laughs> no, I was, I, uh, Sikandar said that you were working on a uh, adaptation of Aisha at last. And I love that book. And I wanted you to talk about like, how did that come up? Like, did you pursue that? Did they find you? Like, what, what were your thoughts on the book? Like all the questions. Oh, good. Yeah, I love that book, too, obviously. Um, no, it was sort of, uh, they pursued me. I, I'll say that. <laughs> uh, it sounds very, very narcissistic. But no, this is how it works. Like, it's it sounds, you know, nice and fancy. But um, basically, you know, studios are, are purchasing books and IP all the time, because that's popular. And, you know, it's, it's a story that's already been written. So IP is a very big strong fancy word in Hollywood right now so books before they're even published are purchased and um, given the rights to a studio to produce so um, even before this book was published in the U.S. Uh, I think the, the producers had found it in Canada and they bought the rights to it so I came in um, after that and they put out an OWA which is an open writing assignment to the agencies and the managers looking for a Muslim woman writer. So they were very cognizant of the fact that they need a Muslim woman to do the story. And I appreciate that so much because I can't tell you how many times, um, you know, they say they want a Muslim writer, but they end up going with a white person or whoever, right? And they're just like, well, we didn't find the right person. Like, sorry, we tried. <laughs> and the reality is that that's just like bullshit because there's so many working Muslim writers now in Hollywood. There's no excuse to like not hire people. And at the time I was on Rami, I was in production in, in New York and I had no credits back then. Like I only had Rami and 
this is Amy Pascal. She's a producer. She's done so many films from the Spider-Man franchise to Little Women. Um, she was the head of Sony for a long time. And she's like, you know, a big name in Hollywood. So when my agents brought the book to me, I was like really shocked that they would even, you know, try to get a young writer like me. But um, I read the book and I was... I, I fell in love with it because I was like, man, this is such a like sweet story. It's very heartwarming. It's, it's very specific to, um, you know, the suburb of Toronto where they're at, which I visited. And I was like, this is a whole world. Like this is, this is like, like a whole Muslim world that I've never seen before. And it was really cool to see, um, that, that kind of world. Cause where I live in LA, like all, everyone's spread out. There's no Muslim neighborhoods. There's no, you know, um, Mississauga. Like, it's not like Mississauga or um, where is, where is the other place? What's the other place? Brampton? Brampton? I don't know. Yeah, Brampton's on <laughs> uh, the yeah. one with the S. Oh my gosh. The one with the what? The S? What's the, what's the name? Surrey? Surrey? No, not Surrey. Surrey. It should no. be Surrey. No. Surrey is in BC. Yes. No, no, no. Well, it's I mean, Mississauga I and... And the other place, the, the other side. Come on, guys. Sudbury? No. The other side, like in BC or in Tro in Ontario? In Toronto. It's it's the GTA area. It's know. where Lily Singh is from and where Drake is oh, from. Oh, oh, uh, oh. Ooh, that's going to bother me. Oh. Scarborough. 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 <laughs> Scarborough. <laughs> I don't think Scarborough. Scarborough is known for being, like, super brown, though. Is she uh, is. Maybe it is. I don't know. Yeah, it is. No, that's it totally is. Bad. Sam, it totally is. So yeah, I mean, I was I was just taken aback by the the thing that really struck me is that the story is between two Muslim people who are very conservative. Like it's not about uh, you know young Muslims who don't identify as Muslim and or like a, a brown person falling in love with a white person. It's like this young Muslim woman in her twenties falling in love with a very conservative um, Muslim man. So it was very interesting to read the descriptions of Khalid, who that's his, the name of the character um, and Aisha. And I was like, Oh my God, white people are reading this and they're like enjoying it. Um, and Sophia, you read the book. Like you, you, you know that like Khalid comes off as a little bit like crazy, crazy, yeah. like a little crazy. A hundred percent. Like he had to so, grow on me for sure. Yeah. And I was like, how are we going to show this on screen? Like he literally wears like a long ass beard and like, you know, short pants, like the guy you find at the masjid who's like praying five times a day, like that's the character. Mm -hmm. So, and that, that definitely exists, of course. And, and all respect to people who you know um, live like that. But, but also it was really hard for me to identify with that kind of character. And I was like, why does she even like him? Um, but, but ultimately, like, I won't spoil the book because you should all read it. Um, it was really interesting that, like, people love the book from a non-Muslim perspective. And I, and I, yeah. I was like, Amy, like, why do, you, why do you like the book? And she's like, well, it's, it's such a universal story. It's Pride and Prejudice, but set in a very specific world. And I, I want you to take it and run with it and make it your own and make it believable, right? So, um, the process was basically like, I, I read the book, I pitched on it once with her executives, they like the pitch. And the pitch is really just my take on the book, like how I would make it a movie and what the story would be. And I, I changed some of the deep, I can't give away a lot. So I, I'm not going to say too much, but um, did some stuff. <laughs> and then uh, I, I pitched it to Amy herself. And you know, that was really, like, literally nerve wracking, because again, I had not done anything besides Rami at that point. So she was very kind to me and, and I ultimately got the job and um, I wrote the movie last year and and turned it in end of 2019 and we've been doing some revisions, but it's been such a fun process and I, I really hope that they, they make it ultimately, that's the goal. So potentially we could be seeing like a Muslim rom-com coming up in, in Hollywood. Please so. keep me posted. Oh my God. I can't believe it's written already. I didn't realize that. That is so exciting. Yeah, it was, it was really fun to write and it was not like TV, you know, it's, it's just you and yourself and, you know, one of the execs who gives you notes, but 
ultimately it was just like my my voice and me and um at times that was very scary but at times it was like so liberating to just be like wait I can make the choices I can make decisions and um and and then and then you know the big thing for me is that this is a South Asian Muslim love story and I was very uh, you know upfront with the fact that I'm not South Asian obviously I'm Iranian and I, I'm I'm really conscious of those things and I, I don't want to write to a culture that I'm not a part of. And I talked to the author, Uzma um, Jalaluddin, and she was really cool with it. She was like, listen, like, as I just need you to like understand the Muslim story, right? Because it's more about being like a second generation Muslim kid in North America than it is about being South Asian, yeah. Hyderabadi. Indian right yeah so she she was really cool with it and I was like all right if you're cool with it then like I'm okay and I tried really hard to get the details right guys but forgive me I will judge you (laughs) I will judge you viciously no get out of here (laughs) but I appreciate so much that you like checked I appreciate so much yeah I mean I, I also went to um I got Scarborough and I visited Brampton. <laughs> I did a whole like uh, Q&A session with a bunch of young uh, South Asian Muslim kids in the town. Like I really tried to like get get a sense of, you know, what um, also like what a Canadian Muslim experience is like in Toronto. So that's how that's why I know so much about Toronto, guys. Like I'm an expert. Trust me. Um, Tim Horton's not good. I will. I will. Stand by that. I will. <laughs> I will fight you on this. Tim Hortons is not as good as you guys think it is. I just need you to accept that. Compare it to what though? What are you comparing it to? Because you can't say like compare it to some cream. bougie. No, come no, on. No, no. Not at all. no, no. Crispy cream. Are you comparing Dunkin coffee or donuts, donuts right now? Are you comparing coffee I'm or donuts? Comparing all <laughs> products. All. Products. Mm, it's tough. That's tough. <laughs> coffee, I will take Tim Hortons all day long over Duncan and Krispy Kreme. But donuts, I would say Krispy Kreme for sure. Okay. I'm gonna have to start this hour on this one. Tim Hortons pretty bad. No, it's awful, but it's all we oh, have. Wow. Hamad talks like about them. this subject, guys. Hamada just <laughs> popped out of nowhere to add two cents of shade on Tim Hortons. <laughs> Unbelievable. They're not sponsor us, thanks. There, yeah, there goes all of our sponsorship potential from Tim Hortons. <laughs> Sorry. They really don't want their money. It's they're yeah, terrible. you agree with me? We're editing yeah, all absolutely. of this out. <laughs> all of it. Yeah. Thank you so much. No, we're not. <laughs> no, no, okay. it's it's awesome. And I and I ate at like a bunch of um restaurants. It was really it was really cool. So I you know, yeah, so the process was was intense but ultimately rewarding and inshallah you guys get to see it one day, I hope. Yeah. We are very excited to 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 see what the finished product looks like. We're excited to see what Uncovered looks like. We didn't even get a chance to dive into your episode that you've written on 13 Reasons Why, which I'm sure a lot of people are excited to see the final season come out. When, when does that, do you know, when does it come out? I have no, that is probably the most secretive project Ooh, because there's okay. such a crazy fan base for the show. And yeah. I couldn't even, it's good that we didn't talk about it because I can't even tell you anything, but um, okay. I don't know when it's coming out. And okay, well, we'll we'll look forward to it eventually. At some point, Netflix will drop it on our laps. And wait, what episode did you write? Can you tell us that much at least? Oh yeah, I wrote four hundred eight. So episode. Okay. Eight. Oh okay. Four hundred eight. Even if you don't watch the show, just go straight to four hundred eight and watch that episode. You'll totally follow everything that's happening. No problem. <laughs> yeah. Not um, anything important happened in the first. Three. Yeah. Nothing. Nothing happened in the first three seasons. Don't worry about it. Um, no, we're super, super excited to see the the episode. We're excited to see Uncovered. We're excited to see what happens there and with Aisha at last. And uh, thank you so much for joining us today. Where can we find you? Yes, what are your what are your socials, your websites? What is the where can people creep your stuff? I am on Instagram at in this jahan, which is like my last name. Um and then awesome. I don't I have a Twitter, but I don't use it, which is bad because writers who use Twitter, but I don't care because uh, it work, but I'm also it's just my name, so you can find me at Sahar Jahani. Awesome, amazing. Thank okay. you, thank you so much for joining us. I appreciate it. Yeah, awesome. thank you. Okay. And keep doing what you guys are doing because it's awesome. And I hope to come back one day. 
Definitely. Yeah, this so, Sarah told me she's only she's only coming back to the Oscars if we give her another award. And I told <laughs> her I'm like if you make something another film. there's a high likelihood. Yeah. But uh, we can't just start I, gifting you awards for no reason. <laughs> I know. Honestly, I really think that um I was snubbed for uh best film. Ooh. I will just say that. And <laughs> with that I am <laughs> This is the real stuff. This is the real people. All right. All right. Yeah. Just just give it to the non Muslim. I mean, you know, it's not a Muslim (laughs) festival. It's an outreach festival. Come on. Yeah. We got to build them bridges, okay? All right. It's fine. It's fine. You had judges. So I'm sure they had technical, you know, (laughs) points and things. It's all good. They did. Our judges are. Maybe we bring you as a judge. Who knows? Maybe one day. One day. Yes. Ooh, so much power. All right, Amazing. take care, okay. guys. Stay Thank you. Warm. Thank you so much, Sarah. I appreciate it. We hope you enjoyed this episode. Thank you so much for joining us. You can find us on Instagram, Twitter, and Facebook by searching Moscow's Film Festival. See you next time.